you well actually each person has to come saying what they got out of the reading so okay did you get were you able to read it Alicia? i haven't i've read some of it i haven't read all of it um what i think is the first thing okay in aquinas's treatise on god where he makes the claim that you know and I completely agree with them. You do need faith and reason to have a better glimpse of what the whole truth is. Um, but I think it's a really bold claim for him to say that Christianity is, or faith, what does he say? Uh, the truths of Christianity are more important, which, you know, I may agree with that as well, but that's just a really, that's a very bold claim, I think. Um, the type of claim that could turn people off to the rest of what he has to say. Um, That's also why the Catholic Church was so powerful in the Middle Ages. Yeah, and and the first question he addresses about um, is anything other than Christianity and philosophy needed, and he says no. You know, all of this other stuff, like historical evidence or scientific proof or whatever that we deal with in modernity it doesn't matter you know if you have a reasoned a reason supported belief that's all that you need so anyway i thought that was neat and another thing and i don't know if it's going to be covered in this but thomas aquinas's view of the environment um was one that in modern times or you know more recent times christians had to go back to because christianity was attacked as having i don't know majorly influenced the western worldview where it's okay to just abuse the environment and nature and do whatever you wanted to do and then say the consequences, you know, God would take care of it if he, if he chose to. Um, but Thomas Aquinas is an example from Christianity where that's not the attitude. So anyway, I just. Yeah, that's, that's crucial. And yeah, this class is gonna go through all the documentation of that. Okay, okay. Where John Locke actually says God gave us the earth to exploit yeah, for yeah. human well-being. So yeah. good for you. That's great. Yeah. Um, Warren, what have you got? Yeah, that's good. Because my thing was, my, my Zoom call was in and out, and my thing was frozen, and I was barely hearing, but it came back on the right time for me to talk. Um, yes, so... From the St. Thomas Aquinas, I, on the knowledge of God, what, what I took from that was that basically his main aim, because he spoke about Aristotle, Augustine, and the Christians, and what I personally liked, which a lot of people don't tend to do nowadays, instead of bringing things together, they separate them and try to put their views. But what he did was he brought the three views together of Aristotle, Augustine and, Christ, and the Christians, not to, mer um, not to merge them as one, but to find a way to all make them seem like they make sense. Um, he did though make view, he did though make, um, make it known that Aristotle's view was different from that of the Christians, but he could add to their view. So because, not because it was different doesn't mean he totally disregards it. He went to the extension to making sure people understand that Aristotle's view is different, but it still can add to what the Christians believed in. And then I realized that he rejected the theologians view that they had that they said um, that we could not know God in any sense. But then he uses Aristotle's word, which said God was the most noble object of thought by nature. So there he is 
showing again that even though he disagrees with what the Christian says, he kind of still believes in what other people have to say. That's where he took from what Aristotle had, had said, um, where he said um, God was the most no, um, noble object by thought and nature. One question I had, though, was when they say no God, or knowing God, what do they mean? Like, do they want to know him personally for yourself or fully acknowledge his presence or existence as supreme? That's that's the one question I have. Good. Okay. So I'll uh, give you the context here. Um, Augustine was 400 AD. That was when- Before Christ. No, no. Was it before? After. No. <laughs> and, After, yeah, my bad, my right? bad. yeah, that's okay. It was at a time when Augustine went to Carthage, the best school, which was run by the Romans, and they had the Greco Roman worldview. And he ran into a lot of corruption and he eventually converted. And part of the reason he converted was that the bishop told him, you don't have to throw away your reason, your mind. You can unite reason and faith. And so Augustine united it in the, in the way we read that split, right? The temporal from the eternal. And that focused on our capacity for math. And then math pulls us out of the temporal world into the world of eternal truths on innate ideas, okay? Now, between Augustine and Aquinas, um, not long before Aquinas, the Greek texts were rediscovered and started to be distributed widely. And there was a community in Southern Spain that had done a translation project and translating the Old and New Testament into um, Arabic, actually. But there had been just a lot of rediscovery of Aristotle. So St. Thomas, the, the uh, Pope, or the bishop at the time, wanted to integrate uh, Aristotle with Christianity because he wanted to integrate the most recent science. Aristotle had, was the cutting edge scientist of the day. And so this bishop wanted to link science and religion. So um, there were people saying it was heretical, right? Off with his head. But, and there was a power struggle there between them. But the bishop, oh, I can't remember his name, who uh, favored the unification, the integration of Aristotle, won out. And so his student, he made his student do the work, which is what people in universities do. <laughs> they have graduate students that do their work for them. Um, so Warren, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, I'm here. Okay. Um, so this is, I usually point out the window at school at squirrels, right? So I have to explain to you Aristotle's view, okay? Um, Aristotle said that everything in nature, and this is where Alicia's right, he was like the first ecologist. He said that uh, what's prior in time is posterior in being. And so he envisioned, or I think his theory describes evolution, that things start out simpler, and they become more and more complex. How do they do that? Um, so whatever comes to be, so his principle is that order is ontologically prior to disorder, or the, the force of order is more powerful than the force of chaos, right? So when you look at that, those genetic mutations, the, the, it's amazing if you look at them under a microscope. I mean, the, there's genes mutating all the time. It's just that the ones that actually get are successful, are fit, 
and eventually become a new species, right, within the, bi the biosphere. They do so because there's a niche for them, because the order that's already there provides a space for them to be able to flourish and reproduce. And that's how you get another, a new species. So the principles involved are that order is prior to disorder. It determines what's possible, that there, there is a force of constant change, but it always gets integrated into the force of stability. And these are dynamically related to each other, right? But the overall uh, trend is toward higher and higher levels of complexity, right? So the biosphere, the ecosphere over time became more and more complex. Okay, the next principle is that every- Question, Dr. Rick. Yeah? I didn't mean to interrupt you. I, you're going down um, a bio, uh, bio, biology road. I had a quick question because you were speaking about mutations. Um, do you think does something have to be man-made for it in order to be um, mutated? No, no, no. Nature is constantly mutating. Okay. That's how you get evolution. Yeah, because that was in terms of like cells and stuff, like outside of like naturistic stuff. So, okay, say for instance, like viruses that are man-made. Well, that's different, right? I mean, okay. we're, we're in a different world. I mean, it's we still have the same principles. It's just that we have meddled with it so much yes. that, that it's a lot harder to predict for one thing mm -hmm. because the order that naturally evolved is being destroyed. And that's why we still can do some predictions, but you have to have those really sophisticated modeling machines to do it. And um, yeah, so we can go there, but we should go there later on after we get to the yeah. enlightenment, right? And yes. what I wanna get to though, is that the principles are the same. It's just that our under, at the time before the industrial age, human beings really needed to live within the order that, not, that evolved or God, you know, ordained because otherwise they die, you know? And so since then we have meddled with it so much that we're, we're messing with it, but the principles are the same. So that's where we're going anyway. So another principle is that, um, so that's how, so Aristotle is an environmentalist. He thought the purpose of life is to understand the universe. And so he's understanding the way that it evolved. And he thinks it's beautiful and it's ordered, but that uh, to understand it is very different than to go in there and change it and manipulate it and exploit it, right? So he thinks that the wisdom traditions are oriented toward understanding it and then understanding our place in it and then creating a culture that integrates culture with nature. And um, you can exploit it to some extent, but not past a certain limit. And that's the greatest sin is hubris to overstep your bounds. And there's natural bounds, right? There's also human bounds like taking revenge, but this is about nature. So the other principle involved is that as these genes mutate and a new species, um, the reason a new species can, form, can come to be is because it is capable of flourishing, right? And so everything seeks perfection. Everything seeks its good, right? Everything wants to develop to its highest level of capability. And if the universe as it is, leaves open a niche where a species like a squirrel can actually 
evolve and start to reproduce and flourish, then it will, right? Because the genetic mutations will, um, in, it's not inevitable that it had to be a squirrel, but squirrel was possible and that eventually became reality. Okay, so the number one property of a squirrel, okay, is that it found that niche. That's its final cause. So why does the squirrel exist? Because there was a niche for that species, right? That's the final cause. The formal cause is that when you study at every stage of the development of the, the species, the original emergence of the species, and at every stage of each squirrel's life, you ask why, right? Why does it do this? Well, because it, that's how to achieve its perfection. So why this? Because that's how it fits in its niche. Those are the formal causes. And they're always explained by the final cause. And those causes are not material, right? So the material cause, the stuff out of which it comes is, right, the, literally the food, the water, all that sort of stuff. And then the efficient cause are the parents, right? So the parents are the ones that started off. That's called the efficient cause. The material cause are the fact that there was enough food and water and oak trees and whatever to make it possible for the squirrel physically to survive. But given that it could survive, then why does it do this? Why does it do that? That's always the final cause because that's how it achieves its perfection, all right? Now, what happened in the modern world is they sliced off the formal and final because they tried to create a new, <laughs> a new nature, okay? Um, and we'll talk about that later, but let's get this first because what you need to know is this is not what you get taught. You get taught modern science, right? You get taught that the efficient cause, the parents and the material cause, that's where the focus is. And because that's what you can change, right? That's what you can meddle with. But, you know, there was an agenda in throwing out the formal and final causes. And it was not the agenda of telling the truth. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so Aristotle had a sophisticated science. And oh, yeah. And also, from when it's the material from which the squirrel comes, like the physical stuff, the oak tree, the water, the, the food, the shelter, all that stuff, that comes from the material. And the material occurs in a cycle, earth, air, fire, and water. And so this is the principle of um, the, uh, gosh, First theory of uh, dynamics, what everything uh, becomes, it just goes into a different form and it comes back in a different form. The preservation of mass energy, right? The overall amount of mass and energy stays the same. Okay, so we had that. Then, then the next thing is when you come to human made things. Oh, like. The law of thermodynamics where yeah. energy isn't lost, it's just changed. Yes. Okay. Right. That, okay. that Aristotle had that. There was a pre-Socratic philosopher Empedocles that said that. Um, so then you have also, you know, the plant, the pine cones, right? The trees. Why is why is there a pine cone? Well, because it evolved that way. Why did it evolve that way? Because there was a niche for it. Because that kind of tree with that kind of a way of reproducing was possible. Eventually it became actual. It doesn't mean that every single possible species came to be, 
because at one point in time, there were X possibilities, but these um, ABC species evolved. Well, that in turn limited or developed other possibilities, and then those species evolved, whatever. But what matters is we are capable of understanding it, right? We can understand the biosphere. Um, all right, the next thing would be um, to take something that's man-made, right? A stapler, right? Okay, everybody see it? Maybe I'll put it there. All right, what is a stapler? Okay, and this is actually common sense. But what is a stapler? Um, is it a black colored thing made out of plastic? Is that what it is? Kinda, yes, in a sense. If you're why, not going into why does detail. it exist? Why does the stapler exist? To bind papers together. Because somebody wanted to, someone to make something that would put paper together, right? Yes. So it's its purpose, its final cause that determines how you set up the factory, right? What to, what uh, material to use? Uh, what, yeah, what material to use? How to order the assembly line? what you know shape to make it all of those physical questions are determined by the final cause and so at every stage of the way when you have we got to get some uh black plastic we got to get some metal we got to get this that's all determined by the formal cause we got to get this because we got to make something that'll staple things right mm -hmm. then you go find the material and also that another cause is some entrepreneur, some capitalist decides he can make money setting up a stapler factory, right? Does everybody understand that? The efficient cause is the guy who starts the business or woman who starts the business. The material cause is, okay, these are the kind of materials I gotta get in order to make something that actually staples things. This, then the formal cause is every step of the way, will it work? Will this make it work well as a stapler? And then the final cause is when you've got the thing and it works, right? And, Almost like cause and effect. Well, the thing is, the thing is, Warren, you it's, don't learn the four causes. You learn, you tend to learn two causes. I mean, the, the final causes were eliminated. And so people still use them, but they, but they don't. They don't use them to describe philosophy or anything because it's it's crazy the way people use it and don't use it at the same time. Um, yes. I'll tell you why, Warren, because in the modern world, we decided to throw out values, okay? So there's facts and there's values. And for Aristotle, everything is for the sake of the good. So there's values in everything. Does that make sense? Yes. Whereas in the modern world, oh, no, we don't make judgments about that, right? And so it, it just gets complicated. But They pay less attention to detail as time goes by. Well, they, that is what, that, where you say um, it's not, we're not taught the four values. That's what I mean when I say they don't pay attention to the detail. Instead right. of choosing us, teaching us four, they teach us only two. I think so. Now you can compare this. Um, or sometimes they they don't teach those causes, but they use those causes without realizing. Okay, so good. Um, and then the next thing is, well, who ordered the stapler? Lion College. Well, why does Lion College exist? What the heck is that? Well, somebody decided that liberal arts education was important for what? For human beings. Why? Because it creates a better culture. Why? Because it promotes critical thinking. Well, what's so good about that? Well, because it prevents authoritarianism. Well, but why lie in college? Well, because uh, uh, maybe, you know, they just bet on that there would be a market for this. Yeah, because, we have that idea. 
What? I'm saying we get the idea. You get yeah, the idea. Like, it just, go, just goes on and on and on. It does. In terms of why, yeah. But it all develops, it's all related to this notion of flourishing, right? They're all correlated. Okay, good. I mean, and students are actually uh, directed away from liberal arts. They're like, that's not where you're going to make money. That's not where the job market's at. That's, and I, of course, going in, like when I started going to Lion, I wasn't really worried about that because I knew what I wanted to do and I, it wasn't necessarily about making money. But, you know, as a young person starting out, that, you know, how much you can make and how many positions are going to be available, that's a big part of deciding your career path, you know? So I know. And um, liberal arts schools are closing down. And I think partly because people don't know why they were set up. And people don't think higher education is dedicated to critical thinking. And they don't think it's necessary to preserve a democracy. They think freedom means, I mean, a lot of people think it's a virtue to strategize your whole life around how to make the most money. And that that's what will make America great. And well, it's I have the freedom what? to instead I have instead of you know I have the freedom really? from right this. Did yeah you have me or what? right that's right and so if you throw out the final cause you know what else is there money and power you know um, but generally a lot of Americans think the reason freedom America is what makes America great is you can get rich in America right. Or you can get powerful. You can um, right. Start. That is the new final cause. If right. there's one at all, it's it's that it's that wealth and that success. The trouble is, the wealthiest people set up the system so that they get richer, and it doesn't really even work for the average person. But they don't notice, um, and it just yeah. Anyway. Uh, Maybe they notice, but they don't care. Really? I just, I it's hard. You know, I've happen. taught, I've taught for 40 years. And so honest, I like to hear what students say, because this, the spirit of the times on campus changes over time, and it's changed a lot. And I'm really curious to know. So, but what my job is to link all of these things that go on around you to these basic uh, foundations for you to see that there's a connection between where we are now in this whole history, that these ideas, whether or not you agree with them, although every week I'm gonna to try to convince you that these, these ideas are the bee's knees, right? <laughs> so last week I just, Augustine, he's a genius. This week, well, no, we're gonna throw out Augustine's view of reason and put in this one, right? And so, you know, I'm going to try to convince you that they're great and that even if you disagree with them, which obviously I don't agree with all of them, they're powerful and they're genius and you can appreciate genius and you can appreciate the power of ideas. So that's, so let's, <laughs> let me keep moving here to the power of ideas. All right. The first idea is that you can prove the existence of God, right? Okay. And the first proof is that nothing moves itself, right? That was the first one. Okay, guys, I'm gonna prove that St. Thomas is an idiot, okay? Here I go. I'm gonna move myself one step that way. Ta-da, St. Thomas is an idiot, right? I'm gonna move myself that way. Ta-da. <laughs> okay, St. Thomas, you're stupid. Matter moves itself. Okay, you guys, what's his answer to that? Uh, you know, the ability to move is what was given to us by God. What was the first part of that motion? The choice, the free will. To ah, make the, the idea, to right? Okay, the first part of that was the idea. Okay, 
And my the idea was related to my final cause of teaching something, right? And that's related, why do I teach this blah, blah, right? Okay, so the first part of that motion was immaterial. That motion occurred because of something immaterial. It was in my head, right? So that was the final cause. And so the final cause is how can I teach this material? The formal cause is, well, actually you can stand up and step to the right, right? The material cause is my body and the efficient cause happens to be myself, right? I could have moved something else, right? Okay, so that's his answer is that nothing moves itself. So everything that moves, for example, why does the squirrel move? The main reason is its niche is there is that niche out there that he's moving toward. And that's not material. That exists because of a relationship between a whole lot of stuff, the other species, right? That's not the material that you see. And so it's not moving itself. It's the final cause that's moving the squirrel. It's that force of everything being driven toward its perfection or its niche. That's the most powerful cause, right? Um, does everybody understand that? Nothing yes. moves itself. So then the, the things, obviously the things that are man-made are not moved on their own. They're moved by us, but even the things in nature. Okay. So then by analogy, the universe does not move itself, right? Matter doesn't move itself. And so there is an unmoved mover. There is a force that moves it in this ordered way, right? It's ordered, we can study that. And that is what God is, is there is a force that holds things in place or that keep prevent, prevents things from being chaotic. And okay, this, okay, and this understanding of God, the God that you know through reason, is just the one that sort of set the conditions, and then the universe runs according to these principles, right? So it, uh, the, the, just set the conditions, and those are the conditions. But matter doesn't move itself. There had to be a mover that set those conditions. Okay. The second one is matter doesn't create itself. It doesn't give birth to itself. And every two-year-old will ask their parents, well, who born God? Like who was God's parents, right? Does everybody understand that? And that's, there has to be something yeah. that there has to be an unmoved mover, an uncreated creator. And the next thing is that matter doesn't sustain itself, right? I can't will that I exist tomorrow. And I can't, matter doesn't sustain itself. So there has to be an unsustained sustainer, okay? And that is what God is, okay? Then, um, the, the fourth argument is ah, that animals, if you notice, they act like they have practical wisdom, right? Like birds make nests. They have nesting instinct, right? <laughs> and um, that, that, all that behavior where things act uh, in the way that's appropriate for them, uh, matter doesn't do that on its own. So there is a cause that has led everything to be the way it is, right? To uh, animals behave in ways. We call it instinct, right? Or you can call it just um, that it developed through evolution. It developed because animals figured out patterns and all that. So this combination of what they're born with, because when an animal is not born with that, it doesn't survive, right? But just that whole process, 
that whole reality is um, God is the sustainer, the, the one who set it up that way, right? So nothing in that view of God is inconsistent with evolution, all right? So the Catholic Church was one of the first churches to accept evolution because they don't think when they united Aristotle and Christianity, then Aristotle for a while was set up against evolution, but then that changed um, because he was associated with a guy named Linnaeus who said there were fixed species, like God had every species in his head and sort of ordained everything. But then Aristotle got recognized for it's perfectly consistent with evolution. So then the Catholic Church accepted evolution. Okay, but the fifth proof, I think the fifth proof is the one that you take on faith. So some of those proofs you take, you can know through your reason, right? Matter doesn't move itself. Every motion has three parts. Let me actually a little bit more. There's the actual idea. I had that idea that I would move to the right. There's the potential, I could do it. And then the motion that you see is me actually doing it, right? Now, let me give another example. Um, what if um, I had an idea that I wanted to levitate a foot off of the ground just to prove to you how powerful philosophy is and so everybody will major in philosophy? you can defy gravity. Okay, so that's a great idea. You get all these converts. Do I have the potential to do that? No, I don't have the potential. Because I don't have the potential, it's not going to happen, right? What about if I walk into the classroom and I accidentally trip over my own feet and fall on the floor? Did I have that idea? No but I had the potential to do it, yes. right? So there are accidents in nature. For example, blindness, right? We have the potential to be blind, but mm -hmm. that isn't the natural order of things. That's a matter of accident. So you don't blame God for accidents, okay? <laughs> That's what we were getting into last time. What do you blame God for and what don't you blame God for, right? Um, so because there is this capacity to see, there's also the failure to develop that capacity. We, there's that potential, but that isn't the way the universe is in, exists in the mind of God, right? Okay. Um, matter doesn't create itself. God exists as the Unmoved mover, God is a completely actual being. Everything else moves from potential to actual. Um, God is the first efficient cause, the uncreated creator. God is the unsustained sustainer. God exists necessarily. Everything else exists contingently. There isn't any necessity that I exist, right? And there isn't any absolute necessity that any of those species evolved. They were part of a process. They developed a niche. Yeah, and then because of the order, this creature who could actually understand patterns evolved. But it would be possible. I mean, there was a time before we evolved where that was possible, but it hadn't yet happened. So it wasn't necessary. It's just eventually it happened. And then our place in the universe is to appreciate that. Like the fact that we can know God with our reason means we should really appreciate God, right? And not destroy the creation incidentally. But anyway, so God exists necessarily. And that's what made it possible because of this necessary principle that doesn't change and this force that keeps order prior to disorder, then it's possible for a creature to evolve that understands the order because the order is there and it's not going away, right? Matter doesn't order itself, right? So um, the force of God is an ordering principle 
that works throughout the natural world. Okay, then um, the last one is, okay, the last one has to do with Christianity, the belief that God intervenes in human life, right? And that's where you study scripture to understand God's interventions, okay? But according to St. Thomas, God doesn't intervene in a way that would interfere with overall laws and principles. So the emphasis on miracles, uh, Thomas Aquinas would emphasize that the, the creation itself is a miracle. The process of order prior to disorder is a miracle. And God is like, God is not going to miraculously make you well in a way that makes it impossible for us to develop medicine and cure and look at the order of things, understand the cause and develop the drugs and therapies, right? For God to start intervening in the order, which is already perfect, um, would just mess, mess everything up. And we couldn't use our reason anymore. And we would just be desperately depending on God all the time. But God will intervene. And that's what you take on faith. God does intervene, but not in a way that's going to undermine what we, what we already have. Can we know God? Well, we can know God as this underlying force. Um, let's see. Okay. On, according to faith, we think, remember with Augustine, God foreknows what we choose with free will. But that's, again, we're still responsible for it, and that's a matter of faith. But God doesn't change it just because God foreknows it. Um, and then everybody has a personal relationship to God. That's, um, that's another Christian view, but it's not necessarily Christian, right? So Alicia got that right, that you can have the same view and like be a Hindu or a Buddhist or, a, uh, you know, a lot of stuff. Um, but the Catholic Church said, you know, it's only the Christian, it's the Judeo-Christian, it's the God who inter, who was the, the son of Abraham, you know, has a special idea for Abraham and the sons of Abraham, right? And that's what gave the Catholic Church power at that time. Um, but I, you know, what I tell my students is, well, you figure it out yourself. At least you can explain what's happened. You can explain a lot if you just go through these ideas. God is personal. Okay. So the fact that you exist is a basic, the most basic, uh, print, you know, force inside of you, but then you also exist within this God-given order, but you have a personal relationship with God, is that um, God is personal, God is simple. There can only be one God, right? Why? If God is perfect, that means infinitely perfect, right? And if God is infinitely perfect, you can't have more than one, <laughs> right? If you say, okay, suppose there's another one. Well, it has to either be less perfect uh, or it has to be have some sort of flaw. So by definition, there's only one. Um, uh, there can only be one because the creation of functions according to a, a certain order. It doesn't uh, destroy itself, right? God is possesses in mind or intellect the mind of god is what set up this very ordered system god possesses a will because god chose to create the universe because god is perfect the universe as it is created is perfect in its own kind and that includes the creature with free will that makes a bunch of stupid mistakes um, god is love so um, the natural object of our will when we choose things, we should do it out of love. And so if God chose to create the universe, God is love. 
God is the paradigm of what love is. Okay, and I know Warren has to go pretty soon. Um, God's causality. So there's two senses of causality. One is caused by his intellect. And so that God caused the, the biosphere and sustains the biosphere. Um, and then the other part is God is the cause of individuals. And that's a matter of faith, right? That God would cause you in particular to be born, right? Um, let's see. Okay, and then I'll, I'll, so I'll let you go for now. And next time, let me just show you what we're doing next time. We're doing um, what this play, how this plays out in practical um, recommendations for artificial birth control, just war, Pope Francis's outline of his values which he, here's the speech he gave to the UN um, and Pope Francis on gay issues. So the Pope before Francis, Benedict was very conservative. He focused on birth control. Pope Francis focuses on international relationships and international cooperation, but it's the same philosophy. It's just a different emphasis. So that's, that's where I'll leave you for now. I think both of you in your comments can sort of, you anticipated this. Does that make sense? You anticipated this difference between God, the God of reason and the particular one. And when you get it, it's just Christianity or it's just my view, all of a sudden you can justify a whole lot. But um, the Pope, Pope Francis has, Oh, I think a lot of really good insights. Um, but that's my opinion, and I talk them up every week. So um, very good comments, guys. And I'll see you on Wednesday. Okay? All right. See you later. Bye-bye.